the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. A few months ago, I got word that a dear friend of mine had died suddenly. He was uh, the facilitator for the Order of St. Helena, which meant that he came and he worked with the leadership uh, about three times a year, sometimes four times a year, uh, to teach us how to lead, to teach us how to look for the real problems in the order, and to teach us how to listen to each other and to all of our sisters. Uh, in addition to being a wonderful teacher, he also lived his faith in a way that was infectious. He was Presbyterian, as you know I'm Episcopalian, and the two of us could do Bible study like you would believe. We'd go to Starbucks, get a cup of coffee, and talk about our idea of what Paul was up to, or what our idea of what our churches are up to, and how we differ. And I just treasured these times with Larry. I spoke to him through email two days before he was coming here to Augusta, and then the next day he died. And I was caught up short. I, I miss him terribly, but I feel I feel like there's a responsibility for me to live up to what Larry would want me to live up to. He did so much for his church. He taught Sunday school. He led adult study. He had Bible study during the week. He led retreats for men, um, and he was an example to his family, as well as to the Order of St. Helena. So I picture Larry and I hope this is true. I picture Larry being in the position that Moses was in when Moses stood on the mountaintop and was able to see the promised land. Now, some people look at this story of Moses looking out at, at the promised land as a tragedy. Why didn't he get to go? But I don't think that's what we're supposed to get out of this story. We are all in the position of being Moses looking out at the promised land through our life in Christ. We are always in the present moment where Christ hasn't come the second time. He hasn't come yet. And we know he will come. And we're yearning for him to come. And we see in the distance the promised land of all that will be. When illness will be no more. When loneliness will disappear. When we will know who we are in God's sight. And we will know that our life was well spent. Don't we all yearn for that before we die? And this is what Moses got to see. It wasn't a tragedy that he didn't get to go to the promised land. It was a blessing that the Lord took him up to a high place. This is Mount Nebo, they think, is where this happened, and it's in the country of Jordan today. And I've been there on a cold and wintry morning, and you can really see forever. You can look up north and you're up at the top end of the Dead Sea, right above it. You can see the Jordan River, which now is a trickling little stream. But you can see up to Lake Galilee in the north and down to Egypt in the south, where these Hebrew people had come from. Forty years, day and night. They were a contentious lot. We know about their problems, and we know that Mo, uh, that Moses had a heck of a time leading his people. And he could not have done it if he hadn't gone up to the mountaintop and talked to God. He talked to God again and again, and he argued with God, and he pleaded for the lives of his people. He was the quintessential leader. And that's what scripture is remembering in these verses which we have this morning, is what a glorious leader Moses was. We don't remember that he didn't make it to the promised land, we remember that he led his people to the promised land. And they took the most incredible journey. It should have taken two weeks, and it took 40 years. But these 40 years, they needed to learn how to be a community. All these, all these Sundays we've been hearing about what Moses is up to with his people has been another chapter in how to listen to God and then act out what God is telling us to do. We listen and then we act it out. We live our life in the Lord through action. And Moses is who we started learning this from. So Moses died 
Unexpectedly, I imagine this is probably what happened. He died. And they were left with a new leader, Joshua, who had his uh, leadership com commended by Moses. Moses had laid his hands on him. So he was the new leader, and off they went. And this is a position that we are in as Christians, knowing how we depend on our leaders to lead us. We never know what's going to happen. The leadership will be gone one day, but St. Albans will remain. We as Christian people don't know when the end of our days will come. We pray that we will have a moment like Moses where God will show us not only that there's the promised land and you've done your life well, you've reached the promised land and now you're coming home to God. But God also allows us to turn around and see what we've done behind. And I think this is what these first five books of the Bible do. They show what Moses did. Moses did an incredible job. The first five books of the Bible, let's see if I can remember them, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Of those five books, four of them are all about Moses. They're all looking back at what Moses did and seeing how the people of God came to be a community. Out of creation came this people, and these people for the first time acted as a congregation, a group, with Moses. Now Jesus is acting through Moses to teach what he teaches to his congregation. And Matthew, more than the other three gospel writers, tries to emulate Moses more than anybody else. So when you're reading the gospel of Matthew, you are reading how Jesus is the fulfillment of Moses. Whatever Moses did, Jesus went over to the promised land and did it not better than Moses, but more fulfilled. Where Moses would go up on the mountaintop and his face would shine with the radiance of him talking to God. Jesus would go up on the mountaintop and his face shone like light. You know how we see those words on the page and can almost envision Jesus shining like light? And he comes down from the mountain and he is the leader of this strange band of misfits. Like Moses was the leader of this strange band of misfits of the Hebrew people. And throughout Matthew's Gospel, you will hear this phrase, and thus was fulfilled the scripture. Thus the prophecy was fulfilled. This prophecy, this prophecy, this prophecy was fulfilled through Jesus. And then Matthew's entire Gospel is divided into five sections to be just like the five books of the Torah, the five first books of the Gospel. There are five discussions that Jesus has or testimonies in Matthew's Gospel, and they're very clearly delineated. And this was for him to say, these are the five sections of the Gospel of Christ to match the five books of the Torah, because he is the fulfillment of the Torah. So when we see Jesus talking to the Pharisees, this is the fulfillment of Moses. This is who he is. And we listen to his words, and we know that he's speaking to the Pharisees out of deep love. What he says to the Pharisees is loving. He is bettering them in this gymnastic match they had going of trying to dare each other to stumble. And Jesus is more clever because he is doing what God is asking him to do in a way that is not competitive. He's not trying to compete with the Pharisees. He's just being himself, which is what God asks us to do. Love one another as I have loved you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. So this is the Jewish Shema. And they are to say these verses to themselves or out loud twice a day, every day of their life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if you're like me, I grew up thinking that love was this squishy good feeling that I got when I watched a Disney movie. And I actually was thinking that's what I was looking for in a husband, somebody who would give me that squishy good feeling, that I would be in love. So I assumed this is the same kind of love that I'm supposed to feel for God. And when I didn't feel it, I left the church. Aren't you supposed to feel good? 
Is this supposed to be a Disney ending and you want to just be in church all the time? Well, circumstance brought me right back to church, and I found that being a good Christian is much more like being in a hard marriage, where you have to stick to it and find out what it is God wants you to do, rather than, when am I going to get that good feeling again? And some of us are lucky enough to have had this connection where we feel that God is really speaking to us. But it's ephemeral, and it goes away, and then you could spend the rest of your life wanting to get that feeling back. I want to feel like I did when I first found Jesus again, when I first came back to the church. But that doesn't happen, because Jesus wants us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and it's not a Disney squishy good feeling. It's hard. And if you don't know how to do it, read the Gospel. It's the Beatitudes. We are to love the Lord our God through our hesed, our loving kindness. It is this tenacious loving kindness that nothing will destroy. That we are able to be intimate with each other and ask each other your faith story. How did you come to St. Albans? Do you tithe? How can I learn to tithe? Which leads me to NPR. This season of the church is when we usually talk about our pledges and what we're going to give to the church. So I'm always thinking about this. And NPR happens to be doing their fundraisers. So, and it happens every year. Whenever we're thinking about pledging, there's NPR doing their fundraising. And I listened to all these wonderful reasons why we should give money to NPR, and I replaced St. Albans in there as I'm listening. I think, this is how much I get out of St. Albans. I need to give back my support and our time, talent, and treasure, right? And why can't we be on public radio and say, what does St. Albans give to you? And ask each other, what does St. Albans give to you? And how long have you been going here? And this little letter that we got about tithing, does that really mean me? This is what we're asked to do when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Just look around at your neighbor. This is our community. This is the straggly group that is going to heaven together. And I do believe we will be together in heaven. This crazy little group is saying all things. So we, get, we need to know our fellow partners. We need to know how are we going to do this next step that we're going to have, not knowing whether leadership is going to be gone one day. We don't know what's going to happen to us. We need to live each day as if it's our last. And if we don't know how to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, you find somebody who you think figures this out a little bit. And you say, I want to be more like you. And tell me how I can learn to do some of these things, like volunteer my time as a secretary, like handing out the food to the homeless who come here and ask for food, like shopping for the groceries, all the things like the flowers that are planted around this yard. When I drive by St. Albans, it looks loved. It looks loved. And do we all know who's doing that? And do we know how it feels to do that? And that's the question. How does it feel to be the one that does that? How does that feel? And do we feel connected to each other? Because we're in this together. So back to Moses, standing on the mountaintop. This has become an icon for me. Not only because I've been on top of Mount Nebo and I've seen what it looks like, but because I don't know when my life is going to end. And I feel stuck. And I get depressed. And I'm sure at the end of the day that I've missed the boat somehow. There was something God was telling me, and I didn't listen. But we are asked to look back. You know, we look at the promised land out there, but we look back, and we say, I tried the best I could. Please forgive me for what I didn't do. But tomorrow is all I've got. Tomorrow's it. Help me to be truly me tomorrow. We're not asked to be Moses or Father Alfred. We're asked to be the person we are with our name. Help me be this person that I'm created to be. Help me listen to the one person who needs me to listen to them today. And help me give out of thanksgiving for what this church gives to me. That's all we can do. And if we make it to the mountaintop the next day, we can be grateful.
So I dearly hope that my friend Larry did get a vision of the promised land before he died. But not knowing whether he did or not, I'm going to believe that he did. Because for me, he was an icon of what a Christian should be. Pillar of his family, worked hard, and he shared his faith with an Episcopalian. <laughs> and I know more about being a Presbyterian because I was his friend. So may we love our friends deeper, be our truer selves with more authenticity, and always look to Jesus as our guide and our example. Amen. Amen.